In the last few weeks, I've been thinking about writing stories about three different companies. The first is Pfizer and its attempt to move outside the U.S. so it can reduce its taxes. The second is Valiant, a company that's fallen in hard times after being a high flyer. And the third is Theranos, a young startup that zoomed to a $9 billion market cap and might be imploding right now. But as I was thinking about these stories, I realized they share one thing in common. They're all healthcare companies. So I decided that the first thing I needed to do was look at how the healthcare business look right now and how it had changed over time. So to get a better sense of what shifted in the healthcare business, I decided to go back to 1991. In 1991, the typical pharmaceutical companies spent money on R&D first. That was a given. They wrote checks to R&D. The R&D churned out products. It went through the FDA approval process. U.S. companies were primarily focused in the U.S., so the domestic markets, and then they had the pricing power to shift all of their costs onto customers with higher prices on the blockbuster drugs. And in doing all of this, they used the patent protection as their primary barrier to entry. What's different now? First, you see more companies growing through acquisitions than you used to then. Second, you're seeing more international business at these companies. Third, I think pricing power is starting to get cramped at these companies, though you wouldn't know it from looking at the prices you still pay, pay for prescription drugs. And fourth, increasingly you see these companies using marketing rather than the patent system to create brand names that they can use to continue to make money. So let's start by looking at why pricing power has shifted in this business. I think there are three broad trends in this area that have pushed down the pricing power of pharmaceutical companies. The first is, in 1991, pharmaceutical companies were, were big and insurance companies were small and splintered. So when you did business as an insurance company, you were always negotiating with a pharmaceutical company that was 10, 20, 30 times larger. Today, as you see consolidation in the health insurance business, increasingly insurance companies are bargaining as equals. The second, whether you like it or not, the government is the largest buyer of prescription drugs in this country. While Medicare is not allowed to directly negotiate prices, Medicaid is, and it already is making its clout felt, and Medicare, even though it directly can't negotiate prices, still has an influence on the pricing process. The game has become increasingly political. Thirdly, pharmacies that used to just, their job is to just distribute the drugs, have become the points at which the, the insurance companies put a limit on prices. So if you show up at the drug at a pharmacy, the pharmacy might actually change that drug to a generic substitute. So pharmacies have become the front, front men in the pricing pressure war. All of this basically has implications. As long as you have complete pricing power, you can afford to spend money on R&D first and worry about it afterwards. Increasingly, pharmaceutical companies are recognizing that that game can no longer be played. So let's look at this healthcare business or the drug business as it stands now. If you look at the companies in this business, they're broken down into pharmaceutical companies and biotechnology companies. And I'll make a confession. I wasn't quite clear what the distinction was. And it turns out that the primary distinction lies in, in what they use to produce drugs. Pharmaceutical companies work with chemicals and biotechnology companies use live organisms to generate the drugs. You're saying, who cares? You're right. I don't care. But that's the way they've been classified. In fact, both these companies generate drugs that go into the, into the prescription drug, the pharmaceutical, the same. They're sold in the same places to the same people. The other difference that people point out to that biotech companies spend more on research, they're riskier, all are more life cycle differences and reflect the fact that biotechnology companies tend to be younger and pharmaceutical companies tend to be older. So I'm going to argue that in the drug business, rather than think about pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies, perhaps it's time to think about younger companies and older companies. And in fact, this distinction becomes critical, especially as some biotechnology companies become really big. This is a list of the top 10 companies in terms of revenues in 2014. Take a look at the list. Four of the 10 companies are biotechnology companies. In fact, some of these companies start to have started describing themselves, Pfizer, for instance, as biopharmaceutical companies, which effectively means they do both kinds of research. So increasingly, that distinction is becoming a difficult one to make. But whatever that distinction, it clearly is true that over the last 25 years, you've seen a shift away from pharmaceutical companies to the so-called biotechnology companies. This is actually the collective revenue at both groups of companies over the last 25 years. And if you notice, 
at the start of the process, it was almost all pharmaceutical companies. And by the time you get to the end of the game, 2014, about 30% of all drug business revenues come from biotechnology companies. In fact, almost all the growth since 2010 has come from growth in biotechnology companies. Pharmaceutical companies have had flat revenues. And we'll come back to that because that has implications for R&D. Now, as the revenue grows, you have to ask, are these companies making money? In initially, at least, the pharmaceutical companies were the money machines. They had huge profit margins. They made money. Biotechnology companies were money losers. So if you ask me to characterize biotechnology companies in the early 90s, most of them were young, small, money-losing companies. That's starting to change as well. Over time, both groups of companies have had healthy profit margins. Now, that actually is tough to reconcile with what I said earlier about pricing power. But I think in spite of the fact that the margins have held up, pricing power has decayed under those healthy margins. But you do notice a subtle shift. Over the last five years in particular, you see that biotechnology company profit margins have improved, while pharmaceutical company profit margins have, if not declined, stagnated. The business is more profitable at the biotechnology end than in the pharmaceutical end. Now, what does this all mean? Both biotechnology and pharmaceutical companies keep spending billions of dollars in R&D. In fact, it's surprising that they continue to spend these billions of dollars, though the game has changed. So what I did was I took the R&D spending as a, percentage of spend, as a percent of sales in both groups of companies. Then I looked at the growth rate and revenues, which is, after all, the payoff you get. From, from the R&D spending. And I'll confess, by, by looking at the numbers contemporaneously, I might be missing the lagged effect, but it's still a useful ratio to compute to take the ratio of R&D spending or, or growth rate to R&D spending. Put differently, you'd want that ratio to be high if you're a drug company because you're getting a much bigger payoff from R&D spending. Now look at that trend line. Pharmaceutical companies used to get a pretty good payoff from R&D spending, but over time that number has decayed. And in fact, since 2010, they've had almost no payoff to R&D spending. And that is what's creating the turmoil in the business right now. The market's noticing. And one way the market is noticing is the market cap is shifting away from the pharmaceutical companies to biotechnology companies. The 1990s, pharmaceutical companies were pretty much the entire market. Today, about 40% of the market cap of drug companies comes from biotechnology companies. So the game is changing. And the pricing ratios are also reflecting this. If you look at the multiples, you can look at a, you know, a enterprise value to operating income or enterprise value to EBIT before R&D. On both segments, you notice the multiples are decreasing. And for biotechnology companies, the reason is simple. They're decreasing because these companies are starting to make money and the growth component is dropping off. But again, an interesting feature, since 2010, the biotechnology companies have, have delivered much higher multiples of operating income and earnings before R&D than pharmaceutical companies. You're starting to see a divergence on this dimension as well between the two. So here's what I think. We have to think about companies on a life cycle and pharmaceutical companies are aging. As they age, here's what's going to happen. And this is true for any sector. Your capital investment has to scale down. In the case of a pharmaceutical company, that means your R&D gets, gets moved away from creating high growth to even low growth to just maintenance growth. And at some stage, you've got to start to think about reducing your R&D expenditure. The payoff's not there. That doesn't mean R&D collectively is going to stop. It's just going to shift to the younger companies in the cycle, which right now happen to be the biotechnology companies. That's why you see mature pharmaceutical companies thinking of different ways of creating value. There's a reason why Pfizer is not pumping billions into R&D and thinking about moving to Ireland, reducing its tax rate, because that's the only pathway left for it to create value. So one of the suggestions I would make as you look as, at this business changing is think in terms of life cycle changes and think about companies that are not acting their age. It's a phrase I'm very fond of. So if you have a pharmaceutical company that's behaving like a biotechnology company, it's in trouble. Behaving in what sense? It's investing huge amounts in R&D even though growth has leveled off. It is going to be in trouble. If you have a biotechnology company behaving like a mature company, in other words, cutting back on R&D, even though that's where the future lies, it's in trouble. So we have to think about companies in the life cycle and then ask the question, should they be spending more on R&D? R&D by itself is neither good nor bad. It's good if you're, a, if you're a commercial organization, only if it creates value. And it is to be held on the same pedestal that we hold every other investment and we have to ask the same question. 
Is this good R&D? Is it going to create value? Is it neutral R&D, in which case I'm running in place? Or is it bad R&D, which means it'll reduce value? And that effectively might be the answer for many larger, older pharmaceutical companies. Thank you very much for listening.